it's my pleasure to welcome you to Northern Kentucky History Hour. I'm your host for tonight, Heather Cook, joining you from my dorm in Worcester, Ohio. Also joining me by the power of Zoom is our presenter, Wayne Ongs. Thank you, Wayne, for joining me. And we also have Sean Mendel joining through Zoom from the museum as well. So Northern Kentucky History Hour is a project of Barringer Crawford Museum, Northern Kentucky's History Museum, that would not be possible without support. Thank you to all of our sponsors, including the City of Covington, Kensington County Fiscal Court, Artsway, Kentucky Arts Council, Northern Kentucky Sports Hall of Fame, the Carol Ann and Ralph B. Hale Jr. Foundation, and our members. If you're not yet a member of the museum, please consider joining for access to discounts and exclusive programming. You can learn more and join at our website, which is bcmuseum.org. We would love to hear from our viewers tonight. So if you have a question or comment to share, please type it in the chat or Q&A feature, and I will be sure to get to those at the end of the presentation. So let's meet tonight's speaker. Wayne Onks is the retired state librarian and commissioner of the Kentucky Department for Libraries and Archives, a lifelong lover of books and reading. He took his first job at the age of 16 in the Laurel County Public Library. After obtaining degrees in history and library science from the University of Kentucky, he was a librarian at the Kenning Kenton County Public Library for 27 years, serving as director of the library from 1999 till 2006. In 2006, he was appointed state librarian and commissioner and served until 2015. He has authored two books, Buffalo Trails to the 21st Century, A History of Erlanger, Kentucky, and Presidential Visits to Kentucky, 1819 to 2017. Wayne and his wife, Debbie, are residents of Erlanger, Kentucky. They have two sons and three granddaughters. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Before we get started, there is a quiz question. So the first respondent to enter a correct answer in the chat on Zoom or Facebook Live will win a Northern Kentucky History Hour prize, and most importantly, bragging rights. So tonight's question is, other than the Bible, what was the first book brought to Kentucky that is recorded in history? Okay, Wayne, if you're ready, you can go ahead and get started. All right, thank you, Heather. Appreciate your inviting me tonight and um, appreciate everyone tuning in to, to watch. Um, we're, we're gonna see a story for book lovers tonight. Um, it's a story that's from a place not too far away from here and not that long ago, but when you look at it from where we live today and the time we live, and it's pretty unbelievable. Um, I hope, hope it will be fun for you. We're going to talk a lot about books and horses, libraries, bookmobiles, and maybe even a little bit of Kentucky history. So I uh, hope it's fun and, um, and hope you enjoy it. You may be familiar with uh, some of the recent uh, bestsellers that have been written about the Pack Horse Libraries. Uh, Book Woman of Troublesome Creek, Book Woman's Daughter, and The Giver of Stars. All these books were on the New York Times bestseller list for a while. And they all brought attention to an aspect of Kentucky history um, that um, a lot of people have become acquainted with and a lot of people know about now. It's, it's very fortunate. These, of course, are all uh, fiction books. There are some nonfiction books that have been written. Uh, Heather Hansen from Danville, Kentucky, wrote the, uh, the book woman, that book woman. If you're interested in, in uh, more information after tonight's uh, program, then you might check your library for one of these books or uh, one of the nonfiction books that, that have been written. I know many of you maybe have uh, read one of these books for a book discussion group, it's been very popular across the country for book discussions. They brought a national spotlight really to the 1930s um, and to a program that brought books to isolated Eastern Kentuckians. And that's the focus of our talk tonight. We are surrounded by books and information. We have fine libraries all around us, especially in Northern Kentucky, we have great libraries. There are bookstores uh, throughout, throughout the community and throughout our state. In fact, we can um, order a book online and have it in a very short time. Many of us have fine libraries at home. But imagine a time in our history 
not that long ago when there were very few libraries in Kentucky, virtually none in rural areas of the state. Books were quite expensive luxuries and difficult to come by. First though, for a little history, uh, you might be interested in knowing that the very first library brought into Kentucky, the first books that were brought in Kentucky really were brought over the mountains from Virginia in 1784. At that time, you know, books were pretty scarce, pretty rare, uh, difficult to come by. These books were brought on a wagon for the newly established Transylvania College. Uh, that library uh, opened up in Lexington and it really served the community. Over the next hundred years or so, scattered libraries were created across the state, but there were not really any public libraries until about, until about 1900. Uh, of course, you're, I'm sure you're familiar with the Carnegie libraries. Uh, prior to Carnegie, libraries were mainly subscription libraries. Folks paid a subscription fee, they could use books. So they're really not public libraries. They were, they were open only to those who could afford to use them and who would subscribe. But Carnegie began to make his contributions. Uh, he would offer to build a library in a community if the community would support it. A lot of communities took advantage, such as Covington and Eport. And I'm sure you're, uh, fam if you're familiar with those buildings that uh, fortunately are still with us, still here, not, not used as libraries any longer, but um, they were the earliest public libraries um, in Kentucky and in, in, in many parts of the country. Um, but our focus is going to be in a part of the state um, that you see on this map, um, the eastern, most southeastern part, uh, about 20 counties, about a sixth of the state, where the Pack Horse Project uh, began, where's, where it began and, and where it was the strongest. And that did uh, include more counties to the north and to the west eventually, but uh, this is the place where it started. Now, in the early part of the 20th century, this area was really, was one of the most poor, uh, isolated, educationally deprived regions in the country and one of the places where the fewest books existed. You know, the, the area, uh, there were uh, very limited job opportunities. Uh, there was a lot of coal mining, a lot of timber, which provided a few jobs, but uh, these, these were extracted, taken away, and not much was left. There wasn't much of a tax base. Uh, the residents were scattered and isolated. Most of the people lived on subsistence farming. weren't, weren't very many schools. Uh, education was very limited, and and um, illiteracy was widespread. Certainly, books were very expensive and quite rare in this part of this in this part of the state. In fact, in many of the homes, the only uh, books were a Bible that may have been brought over from Virginia. Um, and a Sears and Roebuck catalog. Th these were, dist were distributed uh, by the Sears and Roebuck company. You can see that, and it's not a very good picture, but the it happens to be the 1927 Sears and Roebuck catalog. Um, there was provided residents in the hopes that they would, they would buy something from the company. But uh, Bibles were the most uh, prominent, were the, were the most prominent book, the one that was in most homes. Even if people couldn't read it, they had a Bible because that's what they used to record births, and deaths, and marriages, and it was passed down from generation to generation. So most of the homes had a Bible, um, and, and most also had a had a catalog. But that was a that was about it. Um, there was a uh, couple of efforts to make books available to this area. In 1887, a Sunday school class in Louisville, Second Presbyterian Church, learned about the lack of books in Eastern Kentucky and they decided to do something about it. Sunday school class got together, collected some money. They had, a, they had some boxes con, uh, constructed like the one you see here that would hold books, hold about 50, 55 books. They uh, collected donations, they filled the box up 
and they shipped it to Eastern uh, to, to Eastern Kentucky uh, to a store or a church or a post office, a central location where folks from the community could come and use the books. Um, they they made a number of these. The women in the in the church were pretty prominent, so they convinced the L and Railroad to uh, ship these boxes filled with books to the end of the, of the railroad line in Eastern Kentucky where um, horses or uh, and mules would carry them uh, to a location that agreed to accept them. This was really the first, the first effort to get books into the area. Um, and in 18, 1894, when the Kentucky Federation of Women's Clubs was created, they accepted this uh, project as their first project. They expanded it. They made about 100 of these boxes and they shipped them all over Eastern Kentucky. Uh, the plan was to leave the boxes at the station for three uh, months so the people could read them and check them out. They also organized uh, public readings where uh, since a lot of the folks couldn't read, but they still wanted to enjoy the books. So they would set up a time when somebody would come and read to, to, the, to a group in the community. Um, they uh, planned to leave them for three months. That didn't work. People wanted to keep them longer, so they, they left them for six months. Then they would ship the box to the next, to the next location on a circuit. Uh, the, the program was so popular it, uh, that they needed a lot more books. So the Kentucky Federation Women's Club uh, charged their, their um, members 10 cents each uh, across the whole state. If you want to be a member of the club, you had to pay 10 cents. They collected that money and used it to buy more books. They, uh, it was ob pretty obvious that this wasn't meeting the need eventually because they were so popular that uh, they started to lobby the legislature to create a state agency so the state would take over the project. Um, the, um, uh, one thing I wanted to mention that the books became so popular that um, the folks who used them, uh, they never had books before, they didn't really know how to use them. So when they, got to, when they was, were reading the books and they got to a stopping place, they would turn the corner of the page down. Books were quite brittle. They were all used when they became part of the collection. Um, so uh, they began to deteriorate. So the women had to create bookmarks to put in the books to explain how to use a book. And that helped uh, keep the books uh, usable much longer. But anyway, the state did finally agree in 1910 to, to accept uh, charge of these uh, traveling collections. By that time, uh, there, there were about 100 of them about 5,000 books, the state took them over and began uh, distributing them and add, adding some more collections to them and they spread the program statewide. About that same time, Berea College started a similar service. The students uh, in the woodworking shop at the college built boxes like you see here. Uh, they collected donated books and the students would take the books with them when they were teaching at one-room schools in Eastern Kentucky. So uh, uh, in that way, Berea was able to expand usage of uh, the books um, through the months of July through January when school was in session. Now, I wanted to talk just for a minute about this lady who, uh, Ms. Uh, Euphemia K. Corwin, who happened to be the first professional librarian in the state of Kentucky. She came to Berea, in, in 1901, and um, she was familiar with a book wagon that was being used in Maryland. Actually, it was the, it was the very first one in the country. And she, was, she was from back east. She knew about this and she wanted to start this service in Berea. She asked the board of trustees for their support and they refused. She asked uh, Andrew Carnegie if he would supply the money for the book wagon. And he also turned her down. So she took a leave of absence from Berea for a year, went back east to raise money for her book wagon. Uh, she came back with $312 and a promise for a book wagon, which was shipped to Berea. And you can see it there. That was the, the first book wagon uh, in the state, first book wagon in the, in the south, 
um, that was operated by a college. Uh, so Berea operated this. Um, you can see it's specially outfitted to carry books. Uh, you can see the bookshelves there and the books. And there was a, uh, a side of the carriage that would slide shut so the books would, would uh, stay, stay in place. But um, it traveled uh, throughout the 20s, the wagon did. Now, after three years, she ran out of money. The $312 was exhausted, but um, librarians in the state uh, contributed to, to fund the rest of the service. And finally, the college assumed it. Now, a, um, there's another photograph of the, of the um, book wagon. Um, the college promised the funders that they would always provide a Bible if, if a user wanted it. And um, the tr a trip was never made, but what a Bible was not given out. So that was one of the features of the, of the program. Um, it, uh, in the 1920s, they uh, moved up to a car. Of course, it couldn't travel uh, a lot of places because the roads weren't sufficient, but the car lasted until uh, 1943 when uh, gas and tire uh, rationing during World War II made the service impossible. But as the 1920s came to a close, there really wasn't much going on as far as libraries. Carnegie had um, established about a dozen libraries in larger cities and some women's clubs had started smaller libraries around the state. But about two thirds of the state had no service at all. The Great Depression certainly made things worse. The 1930 US Census reported that 6.6% uh, of the state's population was illiterate. One third of the men who volunteered for the, for the army were rejected from Kentucky because uh, they couldn't read well enough. And in Southeastern Kentucky, where we saw earlier, the illiteracy rate was even higher at more than 10%. And that was probably way understated as, as some people wouldn't, certainly wouldn't admit to a census taker that they were illiterate. Um, Six of the highest, uh, the most illiterate counties in the state were in, were in southeastern Kentucky. Now, one uh, in the early 30s, Home Place, which was a um, an institution that was funded by the E.O. Robinson Mountain Fund, uh, started a uh, the the. Uh, really first motorized, motorized bookmobile in the state. Uh, E.O. Robinson was a Cincinnati lumberman who had uh, made his fortune logging in uh, Perry, not Wolf counties. And he decided he wanted to put some money back into those counties where he had made his money. So he, so he started Home Place. And Home Place started a bookmobile that traveled in three counties. Um, it was a station wagon, as you can see, loaded with books with the sides that it could lift up and people could access the books. Uh, this book we will operated until 1953. Uh, during during uh, World War II, um, they used the truck for uh, milk delivery, uh, but uh, otherwise the truck was used for uh, to deliver books, but it could only, of course, travel on uh, on roads where there were services that, that uh, made that possible. Um, now, during the Great Depression, um, things got even worse, of course. Um, fewer jobs, uh, not much money around. So the Roosevelt administration started the Works Progress Administration to provide jobs for unemployed Americans. The Kentucky Library uh, Commission, which uh, operated the traveling library, the boxes that were still being used, uh, looked for a way to expand that service using uh, WPA money. They, uh, they launched on a, they, and they were especially looking for women because uh, the WPA had great difficulty finding jobs for women to do. Uh, men could do a lot of construction and a lot of other type of works, but there was not deemed suitable for women. So they looked for ways that women could, uh, could work, especially in libraries. 
And in those libraries around the state, in the cities, they did employ women, particularly to repair books. And you can see the photograph here of uh, a WPA service where uh, a woman was hired to do to, to repair books. And that was all well and good, but they still uh, hoped to find a way that women could be used to expand library service to areas where that service did not exist. Uh, the WPA funded bookmobiles in a lot of the country. But the problem was, this is the kind of roads that you'd find in Eastern Kentucky. This is a photograph of a road in Knott County, and it's very typical of, of roads in Southeastern Kentucky at that time. There are very few uh, concrete roads. And as you can see, there's no way that a bookmobile could operate in this, under these conditions. So, uh, WPA uh, obviously couldn't couldn't fund um, bookmobiles, but the WPA uh, did agree that they would fund uh, women who provide service uh, on horseback. Now the um, the women that they recruited for these jobs had to be the head of household. Um, their husband could not be employed, and they were targeting women who were who were uh, supporters of their families. They agreed to pay the salaries of the women, but that's all. Uh, the women were responsible for getting their own horse, their own transportation, um, and the federal government would not pay for any books for the service. So there was a young Presbyterian minister in Hyden at the time, Benton, Benton P. Deaton, who, had, who, ran, who was running a community center, and he had a little library that from books that had been donated, so he agreed to provide books to get the service started. The photograph you see here is, is uh, some of the first uh, pack horse librarians, um, and they were, uh, they were headquartered in Hyden using the books that Reverend Deaton had provided. Now, each of the counties had a headquarters um, library staffed by a librarian who would run the operation and manage it. And she would supervise four to six carriers who would travel across the county. Now, depending on their route, uh, they could use various sources of transportation. Most all of them used horses or mules, but there were some that went by boat um, and there were some that went on foot. The um, WPA paid, paid the women on horseback $28 a month. That was the salary. Um, as I mentioned, the women were responsible for their own transportation. Uh, they could uh, obtain the use of a horse for 50 cents a day if they didn't have their own horse. Uh, they carried their books in saddlebags, which you can see in the front horse in this photograph, you can see her saddlebags. Um, or a knapsack, or uh, whatever they could find that would that would uh, transport the books. Um, the carriers were, were responsible for developing their own routes in conjunction with the regional headquarters uh, with librarian and the other carriers. Uh, some of the routes were up to 18 miles for a round trip. Uh, as we saw earlier, the there were very few roads and the roads that didn't exist weren't very good. In fact, most of the carriers uh, used creek beds uh, and mountain paths uh, to reach their, their isolated mountain residents. So an 18 mile circuit under these conditions would, would take quite, quite some time, take a full day. And um, there, are, there were some stories where uh, the women would uh, get caught in the weather um, and they have to spend the night with someone on their route. And it happened infrequently, but it did happen. Um, there are also reports that uh, on those mountain paths, they were, they were really steep. Um, so it, on occasion, the women would have to get, the, it would be so steep, the women would have to dismount and walk their horse uh, up the route. They couldn't ride all the way. Um, 
also they're also uh, during times of flood when they had to uh, walk through some of these some of these creeks their uh, water would get the saddlebags they have to lift the saddlebags to keep the to keep the water out of course they traveled uh, regardless of the weather all seasons um, their feet sometimes would freeze into the stirrups uh, the families of course uh, were very hospitable. When the carrier would come, uh, they would uh, urge the, the the carrier to eat with them. They would share their their meager meals. Uh, I read some stories where the carriers um, really didn't want to eat with with uh, with the families because it took some of their food away. But that would have been a, uh, an insult to the family, so they the, they didn't turn them down. Uh, they they ate with them when they could. And you can see a carrier here in the winter. Um, regardless of the weather, they they traveled. Um, the they felt that there was a need because uh, once the service started, uh, these carriers developed a re special relationship with with the people they served. Um, I'm familiar uh, from my work with libraries of, uh, of later bookmobile librarians, and I know that they also established a very special relationship with the people they served. Uh, this type this type of service tends to to lead to those kind of relationships. And certainly here, the isolated mountain women enjoyed the visits. Uh, they shared friendship with the carriers. They often gave them gifts. Uh, they made them pretty much part of the family. So they look forward to these visits very much. Um, I do want to talk a little bit about the uh, the material that the that the carriers delivered. Um, this the the bags that the carriers carry, which like the one you see here, um, carried stories that were very unfamiliar to the mountain residents. They had most of these folks had never had books before. They'd never had stories like this before. So. These books brought stories of faraway places. They wrote biographies of, of uh, people long, long ago and historical figures from, from American history that, that these people maybe had heard of but didn't know anything about. Uh, they brought sometimes romances, mysteries, adventure stories, poetry, all kinds of practical information that these folks used to improve their lives. Um, they also brought religious materials, which were which were very popular. Um, but they really broadened the horizons of people who who were were extremely isolated and had lived very very uh, narrow lives up until this time. Uh, they brought entertainment. Uh, they brought information. They helped really bring education to the area. For some of those folks that had been to school very very little or if at all, uh, they brought educational materials. And for m most all these families, these books brought a brief escape from what was a, a really a dreadful life of poverty, um, a lot of a lot of hard work you know, on a uh, and very little assistance. Um, the um, the um, type of information they brought. I mean, some of the many of the people enjoyed the fiction. In the stories, but the nonfiction materials they brought were really the most popular and the most requested. Uh, the mountain residents uh, could not get enough about travel and adventure from other places because it was it was so unfamiliar to them. Um, of course, they also uh, wanted religion. Um, children's books were very highly desired. Uh, not only by the children, but also by adults who had a very low reading ability. Um, magazines were as popular as books, especially those with practical information. Now, the program uh, had several issues. Um, at, very, at the first, um, in the mid-30s, when the program first started, there was some reluctance to use a service. Uh, Many of the residents couldn't imagine 
that the service would be free and that there wouldn't be a charge for it. So they were they were reluctant to use it for that reason. Um, some feared the information that would be provided. Information like this had never been brought into the area before, and there was there was a little bit of fear about it. At first, there was a strong aversion to fiction, as as uh, fiction stories were not considered wholesome, and there were some religious groups that objected to to the fiction stories. As a result, the reading uh, material was very carefully monitored at the uh, at the headquarters, and the pack the uh, the pack horse carriers usually travel four days a week, and the fifth day they would be uh, at the headquarters library where they could go through the material, make sure it was uh, appropriate for their for the audience. Uh, they would repair materials, and but they were very careful about what they took, and they. They understood their clientele very well, so they're able to make choices for them. But once the mountain folks uh, began to receive the materials, uh, any uh, objection to it was, was quickly overcome and they uh, were, were, uh, were anxious and they were the, I mean, they were the strongest advocates for the service. It helped that the carriers were mountain women who understood understood mountain folks and understood the the um, ways ways of the mountain people. Uh, but the biggest problem was that there was always a lack of materials, never enough. Um, as we mentioned earlier, uh, the federal government would not uh, provide any any materials for for uh, funding of of uh, books. Wouldn't buy any books. And there were really weren't any books in the area. So there was really, everybody had a difficult time coming up with enough materials to serve the need. And the service never really provided nearly enough. Um, the um, Kentucky Congress of Parents and Teachers, which was, which became, later became the PTA, across Kentucky voted to endorse the Pack Horse Library Project they asked their members to contribute one penny per member to buy worthwhile books and better class magazines as they described it. And this was one of the main sources of funding for new books. But the, PAC, uh, the project put out a call across the state uh, for donated books. Any place that they could think of, they asked, uh, they sent letters, uh, books came from uh, churches across the state and other states, from schools across the state, from rotaries and Kiwanis clubs, from individuals, um, really across the country. Um, one fellow, uh, the Californian, sent the Pecos Library a collection of 500 books. Uh, he had been a native of Kentucky, but he had moved to California. He sent those in memory of his mother. Books were received from the DAR. Homemakers Clubs, uh, United Mine Workers did a book drive, collected books. Um, even the public libraries of Chicago and Toledo sent weeded books, books they were no longer going to use to the Pack Horse Project. If you look at the newspapers in Lexington, Louisville, Cincinnati, and various newspapers up the East Coast, the Pack Horse supervisors would send letters begging for donations. Uh, they made an appeal uh, all, all across the, the Midwest and the East, and they did, they did have some success. But um, the collections, of, of course, were composed mainly of used books. And as they were carried in those, in those saddlebags and in those bags uh, across this terrain and all kinds of weather, of course, that, that uh, made the books deteriorate, not to mention the heavy, heavy use. Uh, the books quickly began to fall apart. Uh, with no replacements, the carriers came up with a unique idea. They took the books that were falling apart, they clipped out the parts of them that could be salvaged, the parts of them that, were, uh, that they thought would be read, they began to create scrapbooks. They included Materials from those books are falling apart. Uh, they would um, 
include uh, materials from church, uh, Sunday school lessons, uh, things from church that were printed in church bulletins. Um, they put craft ideas. They even included quilt patterns that, pe that people would give them. They would ask for materials from their users. Uh, they included recipes that were taken off cans or recipes that were written up by mountain women. Uh, they uh, uh, in included uh, all kinds of stories, clippings from newspapers. Some folks wrote up their family history and they included in the scrapbooks, whatever they could find. And these actually became among the most popular items that they, that they distributed. People loved to get the scrapbooks. Mountain families loved to contribute to the scrapbooks. It made them feel like they were, they were contributors. Uh, it said that uh, there were many new dishes introduced into the mountains from recipes that, that, were, that were contributed. And fortunately, there are a few of these scrapbooks that remain uh, at the FDR Presidential Library in Hyde Park. So you can even go there to see what some of these uh, scrapbooks look like. Um, in addition to uh, delivering books, the uh, carriers would often read to children or to entire families if the parents were illiterate. Uh, there's, there's some really interesting stories uh, I've read about the, about the service. The um, one woman claimed that the service reformed her husband until the books came. He used to go out all the time and would stay out all hours of the day and night. Now, he stayed home and read, and read according to one lady. Another mother uh, told the carrier to please just leave one big one today because the young ones, the young ones fight over them so much. Um, another mother complained because of the uh, amount of oil they were having to buy for their lamp because uh, the children wanted to read in bed after dark. So uh, the project was quite successful. Uh, the carriers not only went to homes, but as you can see here, they uh, went to schools. This carrier is at a one-room school in Breathitt County, and you can see the children gathered around her. Uh, when the, as the carrier would approach, the children knew what day she was going to come. Uh, teachers reported that there was always perfect attendance on the day the book, the book woman would come, and um, they, would an they would anxiously watch for her, and she came up to the one-room school. They would rush to the door and rush out to greet her. Uh, in most cases, these books were the only ones that were available in the one-room schools for the children to use in practicing their reading skills. Needless to say, the project was very successful. Um, it received nationwide attention as one of the most successful projects of the WPA, and it continues to be considered one of the most successful projects. Um, it received the, the attention of uh, Eleanor Roosevelt, who came to Eastern Kentucky, and she visited with a carrier, as you can see um, in this photograph here, in 1937. So uh, it received national acclaim, um, and it was um, you also used in other states in addition to Kentucky. Eventually, there were almost 300 uh, carriers at one time. Um, operating in the mountains in 38 counties. So it did expand to, uh, to a large part of the state. Unfortunately, the project came to a close in 1943 uh, when the WPA went out of uh, existence. Of course, by that time, the nation was at war. Funding was needed for the, for the um, war effort and funding was discontinued. So, um, Library service virtually disappeared from that area um, in 1943 for the next 11 years. Fortunately, that's not the end of the story. Um, at the end of uh, at at the end of the war, um, if you can, uh, this interesting lady 
Mrs. Barry, Mary Belknap Gray came, appeared on the scene. You may recognize her, her maiden name, Belknap, if you're from the Louisville area. Uh, Belknap Hardware Company was, uh, was the big hardware store in the Louisville for, many, for, for generations. Her family owned the store. Um, she married an architect and they moved off, uh, moved east, but he died. After World War II, she came back to Kentucky. She was looking for a project to undertake uh, in her, uh, she said in her, in her uh, remaining years, using the money that she had. She saw the bookmobile uh, in operation at Home Place, which, which you saw earlier. And she decided, well, maybe that could be used some, in, in another place. Um, and she was encouraged by the state library uh, folks who wanted to expand library service. Uh, at that point in time, Kentucky ranked 47th of the 48 states in library service, uh, according to the American Library Association, because there were so few libraries. We were ranked 47th, North Dakota was 48th. However, I, I, I saw a letter that said North Dakota uh, disputed that very heavily. So, but I don't think Kentucky had much of an excuse because there, there were so few libraries and so, so little funding available. But anyway, Mrs. Gray uh, took a um, surplus army ambulance which you see here after World War II, they were getting rid of army equipment. She bought this ambulance, retrofitted it as a bookmobile and offered it to any county which would agree to fund it. Hart County did, they accepted it. That was her first bookmobile. She bought six more uh, over the next few years and they were in various parts of the state. Two of them did get back to Eastern Kentucky, one in Bell County and one in Rowan County. They were extremely successful. People loved them. Um, and this gentleman, Harry Schachter, who is president of one of the largest department stores in Louisville, uh, saw her bookmobiles, saw them in action, heard about them. He proposed a campaign to buy 100. Uh, the state would, uh, uh, he would raise the money from uh, public citizens, pri private citizens, corporations, to buy 100 bookmobiles. Uh, the state would put in some money to, uh, to uh, put books on them. Local counties would accept the, would accept the um, cost of operation and we would put a bookmobile in every county across the state. This was in 1953, he started his campaign. Uh, you can see there the plan. Uh, donors came from across Kentucky. Uh, it's really a, a campaign that's unique to Kentucky. Nothing like it has been done before or since. Uh, a lot of companies gave, tobacco companies, the Courier Journal and Times. Uh, lots of uh, wealthy folks gave. They raised the money in, in uh, different ways. Now, this gentleman was a horse owner. In order to raise money for the campaign and to make to give publicity, he named his racehorse Bookmobile. Uh, you can uh, uh, imagine uh, how that went on the racetrack. I can, I, I said, I can only imagine when that uh, horse came down the track, how the uh, announcer would say, here comes Bookmobile. But um, and Bookmobile actually raced uh, 11 times he won, and he won three races. He had two, two second places and two fourth places. So he was a quite successful racehorse. And he, but anyway, he helped raise money for the bookmobile. They brought in for the campaign Rocky Marciano, who is the world, undefe world heavyweight champion, the only undefeated champ in history, he came to Louisville to, ra to uh, do a benefit for the bookmobiles. Um, the... Um, in, in uh, November of 1953, the state undertook a, camp, uh, a, a campaign to get donated books for the bookmobiles. All across the state on one night in November, uh, folks put donated materials on their porch. They turn on the porch light, put donated books there. Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts picked them up. Um, 
JCs transported him to a central location um, in Northern Kentucky, the Green Line took those books to Fort Thomas and there were more than uh, 750,000 books collected on that single night to be used on the bookmobiles. The project was successful. And in September of 1954, you can see the 100 bookmobiles uh, on the road uh, coming down the, this is come down Broadway in Louisville, going to the state fairgrounds where the governor uh, presented the bookmobile to each county uh, that got a bookmobile. There was a ceremony there. You can see the governor presenting bookmobiles and, and uh, in the lower right-hand corner, there's a microphone where he's making the presentation. And uh, Kentucky went from uh, the fewest bookmobiles in the nation to the most bookmobiles in the nation in one day. And since that time, uh, and even to this day, Kentucky has more bookmobiles than any other state. You can see that one of those first bookmobiles, how the children were lined up. They were, uh, the service was received uh, so well. Of course, once again, uh, there weren't enough books. They were continued to scramble for books, but um, uh, the service was extremely, was extremely valuable, extremely well received. And this is one of my favorite pictures. You can see some young men who had young boys who had who just gotten their books, and I'm not sure if they're getting ready to put them back or, or just taking them off. But they but they uh, that's that's the people that benefited the most from this service. Um, that program also received national acclaim in 1965. This that's Mrs. Johnson, first lady, who came to Kentucky to. Um, get on a bookmobile, similar to how uh, Eleanor Roosevelt came in 1937. Mrs. Johnson came in 1965 and she toured a bookmobile in Breathitt County. I like this quote, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens could change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. I think that's the story of library service in Kentucky and I'm very proud of, of the library service we provide now. And um, I think it's important that we know the, the story of how we came to, to where we are. We provide very strong service. It wasn't always that way, but because a lot of people uh, have, have been very committed and have worked very hard, uh, we can all enjoy the service that we enjoy today in all 120 counties. Uh, now, I wanna finish up. I know that uh, we had the, um, Trivia question. Um, and uh, the story is, we, we know that the Bible was brought by some of the early explorers. Uh, we, we've heard that some of the early explorers brought songbooks to sing around the, uh, around the campfire. Uh, but the first documented book uh, was brought by, of course, Daniel Boone, as you probably know, you, you would expect. He hunted all over Kentucky, came many times. To, he claimed a lot of land in Kentucky, but unfortunately, uh, based, practically all his land that he claimed he lost. And there were a lot of lawsuits about his land. Well, in 1796, one of those lawsuits uh, came before the court and Daniel Boone uh, uh, made a deposition. And in that deposition, he said he was he was hunting in Kentucky in 1770. And around the campfire, he and his uh, fellow hunters read Gulliver's Travels. And he even named a creek there for a place uh, that was that was mentioned in Gulliver's Travels. So as far as we have a legal record or any documentation, Gulliver's Travels was the first book uh, that we know of that was in Kentucky. All right. Um, so now that, you, now that you've gone over the trivia question answer, we did have a winner. Um, it took pretty much the whole presentation for somebody to get it. We had so many great guesses. Wow. Yes, but Patricia Go, 
Gao, I hope I'm saying that right. Congratulations, she did win. Um, so make sure to get your mailing address in the chat and we will send you your prize. Um, so far, we don't have any questions yet. So I don't know if there's something else you want to expand on while people are getting those questions in the chat. Um, let's see. No, uh, just just accept that I, I think it's it's um, pretty remarkable that from 1954 until now, which is um, almost almost 70 years, Kentucky has had the mo had more bookmobiles than any other state. Um, and, and we still have a lot of bookmobiles operating. And in fact, and people, people um, just love, love their bookmobiles. We have uh, bookmobiles that are traveling in, in many counties. Now, in some urban counties, we've transitioned from a, from a bookmobile to, uh, to a different type of, of mobile service. But we still have that type of outreach service in almost every county now. Um. Maybe you could talk a little bit about how you first started becoming interested in researching this. Uh, well, um, of course, I'm a librarian. Uh, I've, you know, I've been in libraries from the very first time that my parents would take me. So I've always been interested in library service. But um, I've um, done a lot of research on the bookmobile project, and I, I eventually expect to. Um, to write about it. I think there's a lot of folks involved in that project who really haven't gotten the recognition that they should have. So I wanna make sure that we really know who's responsible for our success with bookmobiles. So in doing that research, I was looking at the different ways that we provided library service in Kentucky over the years. And the, uh, you know, the pack horse service was is really one of the most in, uh, important ways that we have provided service. One of the models that we, that we use, that we even use today in our uh, outreach services. And it's, it's um, just a, such a neat service, uh, unlike any other service really in the country. You know, we, 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 we started it, we came up with a plan. Um, the folks during that day pulled it off, which I think is pretty spectacular, the success that they had. So I think when you, when you uh, when I, the more I learned about the service, the more interested I, beca I became, and I wanted to find out more details about it. So, and there, there really hasn't, until recently, hasn't been a lot written about it. Um, what was maybe the most interesting thing that, um, or unexpected thing that you came across in your research? Um, I think that, um, um, probably the the creative ways that they got materials. You know, since the federal government wouldn't wouldn't provide any money for materials, you know, they provided, they provided the twenty eight dollars for the for the a month for the carriers, but they wouldn't provide any money for the for the books. So, how did they come? How were they able to come up with with the books for? Uh, to provide the service when there were really none in the area at all. They had to bring everything in. So I thought the story about the uh, the scrapbooks where they, you know, they really created their own materials. Um, and they used a lot of things that the mountain people provided. You know, you, uh, the people loved the service. Uh, they devoured it. And I think giving them an opportunity to uh, contribute materials and contribute information really gave them a, a, a buy-in and it, it made a way for people to be able to share information uh, from each other when they had really no other way to do it you know there was not much communication there were no phones or, uh, or anything like that so uh, they were able to learn from each other and uh, and I think that's pretty cool um, so we have a question here asking if Kenton County Library still has a bookmobile? Uh, they don't have a bookmobile in the traditional sense, but they do have outreach vehicles that take uh, materials to uh, kids uh, in daycares, head starts, uh, places like that. And they have outreach vehicles that deliver 
materials to folks in their homes that are uh, shut-ins. So it's a similar service. Um, they don't have a book wheel in the sense that it, it goes to a neighborhood or a community center and stops and lets anybody come on. But they still do have vehicles that provide, uh, provide a similar service. Um, and we have another question here, I think, asking for maybe a little bit of clarification, because I know you mentioned both um, pack horses and bookmobiles, and they were wondering which one Kenton County had, or maybe it was both. Yeah, no, Kenton County had the bookmobile. Yeah, the pack horse project didn't come uh, up into northern Kentucky. It was uh, mainly in eastern Kentucky and southern, southern, some counties in southern Kentucky. You know, the uh, in this area, the roads were good enough that uh, service could be provided in other ways. Uh, the Pack Horse project was successful in those areas where they didn't have many roads and, and uh, the population was pretty isolated and sparse. Um, we don't have any more questions um, as of now. Um, and it is almost 6.30, so is there anything else you would like to add before we maybe wrap up if no one else has any more questions? Uh, no, I, I hope, uh, if, if folks are interested, I hope they will go to their library and uh, check out uh, one of the books about the Pack Horse Project, either the fiction books that we mentioned earlier or, uh, or, or some of the, there's a couple of good nonfiction books about, about the Pack Horse uh, Library. So I hope you'll do that. And the second thing is, I hope that you'll support your library. You know, um, uh, in some ways, uh, uh, you know, libraries are are under fire in some communities. And there's some. Um, oh, I, I see. I see Brenda Clark, where um, so I, I worked with Brenda at Kenton County, and uh, Brenda, Brenda was a bookmobile driver, right, Brenda? Uh, as I was at for a time early early in my career, I was a, I was a substitute, and but and Brenda, uh, Brenda was a uh, a bookmobile driver, and uh, so uh, so she knows she knows what the service was about, uh, and and uh, those bookmobile drivers were special people. So fun! Well, thank you for joining us, Brenda. Um, you have multiple comments here thanking you for such a wonderful presentation. Oh, uh, but anyway, so I hope folks, so folks will go support their libraries. Libraries need your support now. And, uh, you know, so I, I hope folks will go support their libraries and use their libraries and, and make sure that, uh, that we keep them because they're really, really important in the community. So I hope we'll, uh, I hope you're going to do that. Uh, so I guess. We'll go ahead and wrap up. So we do have some promotions to share. Uh, calling all little witches, goblins, and ghouls, our next Chippy Sensational Kids Club will be on Thursday, October 13th at Barringer Crawford Museum. Preschoolers and their parents are invited to celebrate Halloween with spooky stories, ghoulish crafts, and bewitching activities. There is a $3 materials fee um, per child plus museum admission and you have to register at least three days in advance by calling the museum, which is 859-491-4003. And then there's the motion for that. Um, and the holidays are just around the corner, and that means the return of Holly Jolly Days. So mark your calendars for our holiday toy trains and antique Christmas exhibit and our winter wonderland light up displays that will be starting on November 11th. More information will be coming soon. Lastly, our Northern Kentucky History Hour will be on Tuesday, October 3rd, as our program moves to Tuesday evenings. Janine Crimebrink will be presenting Two Faces of Kentucky Slavery, Henry Bibb and John W. Anderson. Please be sure to tune in for that. We will not be having a Northern Kentucky History Hour on October 31st due to the holiday. 
for more Northern Ducky history through the week, you can check out our Facebook page and our YouTube channel where you can find the latest curator chat along with all the past Northern Ducky history art presentations. They're also available on our YouTube channel at, which is at BC Museum. So please like and subscribe on all of those channels and videos. Um, and that's all we have for this evening. Thank you again to all of our sponsors and the supporters of BCM. Until then, take care everyone and good night. Thanks everyone.